afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Byrne. I'm one of the two business librarians here at UTA, so if you've never seen us before, I'm here and Ruthie's down there. So we're here to help the business students. We'll help anybody. Anyway, we're here this afternoon to welcome uh, you to the Focus on Faculty series, which has started in 2002, 2003 academic year, and it's sponsored by the library and the Honor Society Phi, excuse me, Phi Kappa Phi. I kept it fine. And so we wanted to expose everyone to what the faculty are doing here on this campus. And so this is a reason we invite faculty each month, three months, four months during each semester, and to share their information with you. Today I have the, the privilege and honor to introduce to you Dr. Nur from the, he's a professor in the Information Systems Department in the College of Business. And a little information about Dr. Nur. He is a UT alum, according to what I found. He completed his doctorate in 1994. And after teaching at a number of other universities, he came back to UTA. And so he is now in the Information Systems and Operations Management Department. His research areas, excuse me, include agile software development, social networks, text and data analytics, knowledge management, and software design. He has num numerous publications and journals and chap book chapters. He has recently served as an associate ed editor on the European Journal of Information Systems. It's one of the ranking journals in the field. And he currently serves on the editorial board for the Journal of the Association for Information Systems, another prominent journal. Today's presentation is titled Drawing Actionable Insights from an, from an Analysis of Unstructured Data, the Case of Text Analytics. Please help me welcome Dr. Nord to the podium. Thank you, Carol, and thanks to uh, thank you for, uh, for inviting me to speak here today, and thank the audience as well. Uh, it's very kind of you to be here at this hour. You should be having lunch uh, in a cozy environment. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, uh, a topic that's dear to me. Um, I have uh, spent a fair amount of time investigating uh, natural language processing and text analytics, and uh, I'm now trying to apply some of these things to. Uh, problems, research problems that can eventually get published. Uh, at the end of the day, I want to get them published, right? So everybody knows that, uh, well, let, let me first tell you what I'll be talking about. Um, this is the outline of my presentation. I'll start with a brief introduction, talk about uh, you know how data is growing at an exponential rate and how data is the currency of the digital age and how people are striving to make sense of all this and you know, we're looking at this economic engine that can derive insights, that will drive business value, and so on and so forth, right? So that's, uh, I think, already covered the introduction. But anyway, we'll get into that. Uh, I'll give you an overview of text analytics. You know, what is text analytics? You know, what do we do with text? And how do we uh, mine the data from text? And how do we draw insights from it? Uh, and then I will clarify some of these things with uh, research examples. You know, I'll start with some very academic pieces, uh, talk about what we did, and, and then draw panels with um, other uh, types of data where one could use the same techniques, right? And finally, I'll also mention uh, some of the tools that I use for text an analysis. There are plenty of tools out there. I'm going to just focus on the ones that I use, okay? So uh, everybody knows that um, our data is growing at an exponential rate, you know? Uh, so depending on the, the slides or the websites that you visit, uh, they're going to say, you know, 90% of the data was, uh, that we see today was created in the last two years, right? Or what we have generated in the last two years far exceeds what we have created since the dawn of mankind, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, these numbers can be questioned. I'm not here to question the veracity of those numbers. What we are more interested in is the fact that uh, everybody agrees that data is growing exponentially. You know, we all leave digital footprints every day uh, when, you, when you email when you create your blogs, when you text, when you go to Facebook and post messages. So there's a lot of information, and not to mention your pictures and your cell phone images and everything else that you create. So you alone are generating a lot of information, right? And then when you look at the collective, it, it just is huge, right? So it's little wonder then that people are making these claims. I'm not interested in uh, data in, 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 the, in the general, but I'm interested more in unstructured data, right? And if you look at uh, how unstructured data is growing, that is uh, uh, even more steep um, uh, in many estimates. 
Uh, and this data pretty much is coming from all kinds of sources. You know, you're looking at images that have been created, audio files, video, uh, high resolution. Uh, obviously, you know, we, we see text out here at the bottom. So text is right next to numbers. Uh, we've been generating numbers. You know, our transactional systems have been producing numbers for a long, long time. But there's also a lot of text that's largely been ignored. You know, uh, complaints from customers, uh, uh, doctor-patient interactions. You know. Uh, Complaints by patients. Um, you think about any any type of comment that's out there, and there are plenty of those on different websites that can be very easily scraped. Uh, it's largely been ignored. Nobody's really used those for for analyzing or drawing insights or understanding the customers. You know, this is the day of personalization. We are talking about personalizing things, personalizing websites. You know, we could each be going to ut www.uta.arlington, and each of us would see an entirely different screen depending on our preferences, right? Our personalities. Uh, so you're looking at a high degree of customization, personalization of everything, <coughs> starting from you know websites to medicine to uh, the use of cell phone and email, right? Uh, you can already see that with what Google is doing. Every time you go to Gmail, you see ads that are that are targeted to you, right? Based on your search patterns and things that you've done, right? So you're leaving a footprint out there, and people are taking all this data, right? Uh, classic examples of these are Google and Facebook, right? The services are free. And the real value is in the, month, uh, the, in the data that you provide. The, the, it's the data. In, a couple of days ago, CNN had, had this article. Uh, there's an article on CNN that said, uh, that said that the data in your car is more valuable than the car itself. <laughs> right? Uh, and if you think about this, um, a, a driverless car, when it becomes a reality, and it'll be pretty soon, I think, not in the distant future, a uh, driver, driverless car is going to produce, uh, on an average, you know, it's going to be about one gigabyte per second. Right, which means your iPhone, a typical iPhone, in 30 seconds is going to be full, right? Um, but that's not where the storage is going to be. You're going to go to the cloud, right? You're going to go to other other places where everybody can look at this data, analyze, and figure out where you eat, where you stop. So think about all the data. So your car's data is not simply about predictor analytics, you know, telling you which part is likely to fail, but it's also when you back up. You think a camera is a safety feature, indeed it is. You know, it helps you park your vehicle safe, safely. But it's also taking other information about surrounding cars, you know, other cars on the block, um, uh, vehicles on the block, uh, pedestrians. It gives you information about the geography, the latitude and the longitude where it exists, right? And all of this uh, can be mined in certain ways, right? And combined with other pieces of data to draw insights. Okay, so um, this particular slide is just saying that unstructured data is also exploited, right? And um, by, by some estimates, it's uh, growing at the rate, it's about 45% uh, per day. Uh, that's, that's the rate at which uh, it's growing, it's, it's enormous. So how do we make sense of all this? How do organizations use this data to draw insights? That's fundamentally what I'm interested in, right? What most of us are interested in. And as researchers, for us, how do we translate the, these into research projects that can be published in good journals, okay? So let me start off with a very, uh, I'm not using the mic at all, do I need this? Uh, am I audible in the back? Yeah. Okay. I feel like a cowboy with two guns. <laughs> just rather just useless. So anyway, uh, when we look at uh, uh, text analytics, um, as I said before, a lot of unstructured data has been generated all the time, right? Uh, now if I have to do anything meaningful with this data, it's pure text and it's unstructured, which makes it somewhat difficult. Now, not all text is unstructured. You know, you have XML, you have semi-structured data, quasi-structured data in some format where you can infer a certain schema, a certain organization, uh, and, then, and then put it in uh, Excel spreadsheets and then analyze those. But real uh, meaning comes out when we take, these, uh, take text and convert it to numbers. Because once you get it in the form of numbers, I can then subject it to quantitative analysis, right? I can do the traditional statistical tests on those, I can do uh, machine learning, I can do apply any type of quantitative analysis to the data once it's converted to numbers. And that's exactly what we try to do. So most traditional data mining techniques like classification, uh, or if you're doing a, a, you know, a prediction, uh, you want to build a predictive model, they rely on numbers, and those numbers can be obtained from text. Okay? And that's, I'll show you how exactly we do it, and some of my examples that illustrate that. Okay, so why text analytics? What are, what are people use text analytics for? Uh, very simple. The simplest example that one can find in most books is classification. 
right? So you guys have probably used uh, in your email, some of your mail goes into a junk folder or spam filter, right? It's quarantined and you get a report maybe once uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, how do they do that? It's being done automatically. There's no, no person out there who's sitting and classifying this, right? Now, perhaps in the past they did. In fact, there are uh, institutions, and I've dealt with this, you know, I got this report, and I serve on a committee for IT governance, and I got this report about how OIT is being used, and these were, uh, you know, these were comments from students and st faculty and staff. And somebody had actually hand-coded positive comments, negative comments. So a student work study looked at each of those 900 comments and then looked at this, right? You should be doing all that. It should, it should be automated. The whole process should be automated. Okay, that's, that's the purpose. So classification is this whole idea of, I know what a spam looks like, right? Over time, I've built this experience. So I have a group of emails that are that, I, that are known to be spam, right? And I know groups of emails that uh, are all these other email texts that I know are legitimate, right? Valid emails. So once I have this, I can then build a predictive model, right? So I can I have past data. I can uh, take a part of this and train my uh, uh, model to uh, to to recognize, you know, when spam comes in. So then I give it a new email message and it's able to classify correctly, right? And the more data I get, and every time I now the, the beauty of this is that this is a data product. A data product, product is somewhat unique, right? A data product gives you results that are somewhat meaningful, right? That, can, that are actionable. You can take some, uh, uh, do something with it. But what you do with it also becomes data, right? And so it's, so it's a perpetual generation of data and insights and learning that's going on. So these are self-adapting, self-learning, right? And that's what really gives you value, right? Um, and that's that, uh, most classification systems use a naive base or some classification algorithms in order to do this. Clustering is a very commonly employed technique, and the idea here is to segment, right? So if I have customer complaints and I want to segment those, right? I want to put them into different segments and understand what each of these segments, why are they different, right? What's happening within cl within the cluster? What's happening across clusters, right? Let me give you an example. HP, for example, would uh, like every other company receives a lot of complaints, right? And they have many product uh, groups. So they have printer divisions, they have computers, and printers deal with, uh, you know, they, they could be the ribbon of the printer, it could be you know, different things. Um, in the past, they had some human beings sit there and actually classify these emails as they came in. They would say, well, this is for the printer group, right? And then you forward it to the printer group. This is for the computer guys, and then you forward it to the computer guys. Soon they realized that with, you know, advances in technology and machine learning and all that, they should be using tools to do this automatically, right? And now tools take the emails and classify them accordingly. Right? They automatically send it out to the groups that should have it, right? So this person, uh, you take the person out of the equation, it's all automated, right? And uh, that's the whole idea, you know, it's not to, uh, not to replace humans with machines, which is, which is good in many ways, right? But, uh, but, to, but to be able to make decisions very quickly, right? Especially these operational decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. So clustering is a very common technique. You can, you can use, use it for documents, you can use it for reviews. You know, if you're a law firm and you want to cluster them based on similarity, right? And you have a new law case and you want to figure out if it belongs to this group or this group, very easily done, right? So that is uh, a very common technique. You can look at similarity of documents, including things like plagiarism, right? How similar to documents? Um, how similar? So. If you abstract out of this, you know, what do I do with this? It's not the documents per se that I'm interested in, right? If you can look at documents from two different companies, now I know the similarity between these two companies, right? Let's say this is their strategic vision for the next 10 years, right? And I have a written document, and then I have a written document from company B, now A and B, and I can look at the level of similarity between the two. So I've had a bunch of companies, I could do some clustering here, you know, these are the different clusters, and this is where they're going strategically. And the, so I can then go back and look at what they do in order to achieve their strategic vision, right? I can draw some, you know, we have done years and years of research and management in other areas where we use traditional techniques, right? All I'm doing is taking data that's, that's not very, uh, uh, you know, that, that's never really been used for such purposes, converting it to a form that can eventually use, be used in traditional research. That, that's the entire point. We can identify authors of a document, right? Somebody claims to have authored a particular document. Right. So I could, for example, take the writings of every professor on campus, build a classification model, and then let's say, oh, let, let me give you another example. So a student writes uh, an essay, a term paper for me, and it turns out to be very, very good. So what I do is I decide to get it published, right? Without including the student, right? 
So, uh, so the student comes back and sues me, right? So what's the proof that it's the students, right? I, you know, my word, faculty word, faculty's word against the students' word, right? I'm going to say, no, no, it's my own work. It's original. It's, it's what I've done. Well, what I do then is I ask for a sample of my writings, ask for a sample of the uh, students' writings. I can figure out who actually wrote the paper, right? Because there are patterns that we use, how we ex express ourselves, how the language we use, right? The nouns and the adjectives and the order in which we use them. Uh, you, you may not realize it, it's all latent. It's there in your writings, right? And this will surface when you start looking at more and more of one's writings. Right? Predictions uh, can be used reviews to predict sales. Can be used reviews to predict consumption preferences. You know, can I look at it? Some, it's not, well, here I'm not just talking about text. You know, text is good. With text, I can actually extract personality, get personality insights, right? Uh, I can also get consumption preferences. This person like to buy an expensive car or an inexpensive car. Does this person go for safety or does this person go for speed? You know, uh, I can get all those insights. And uh, IBM Watson is what I use for most of these things. And they, they've done a splendid job of building APIs that I can call very easily from my system. I just use Python, call these, pass the text, and comes back and you know, it gives it to me in a certain format, which is not you know, uh, 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 readily accessible to people who are not very familiar with programming. But I take this and then convert that into a spreadsheet. And then it becomes a regular spreadsheet with, with data, right, that I can then analyze. So predictive analytics, plenty of opportunity. And if you combine your text with, uh, with images, uh, we can draw even more insights, right? So from an image, I can, you know, so let's say it's some person's image. Uh, text, uh, image processing is, got, uh, is at a stage now where it can tell you if this person, you know, based on the glasses, the type of glasses he's wearing, or the, the watch, if it can discern that, if the resolution is good enough, it can tell me if this guy is, uh, you know, goes for cheap stuff or expensive stuff, right? Now you combine that with the reviews, which tell me about the consumption preferences, and then further combine that with the personality insights that you draw, uh, and you have a pretty decent profile of a, a customer walking into your store, right? Um, so predictions are very useful things. Yes. Sentiment analysis in the past it used to be positive or negative. Okay, today when uh, even in student projects when they give me positive or negative, I say this is you know fifth graders can do this. I don't want this, right? I want something more, so I want deeper insights, right? Uh, but that's where we started. We started with, you know, uh, are these positive tweets or negative tweets? You know, where are the positive tweets coming from? Which state are they coming from? Which city are they coming from? Which location are they coming from? So if I combine that with latitude and longitude of the tweets, I know where exactly they're coming from. Then I can say, you know, people in this county are very happy. People five miles away are not so happy. And why is that the case, right? And if I can also then combine this with buying patterns or preferences, you see I have a pretty good idea of where to market things, where to open up stores and so on. Yeah. Assessing opinion polls very commonly employed, right? Uh, and these have been pretty useful. Um, they, they look at text, uh, the opinion polls, and then try to predict you know, who's likely to win or lose. Psychological insights, and this is what I've been focusing on lately, uh, these are now, for those of you who are familiar with the five-factor model of personality, uh, you're looking at things like agreeableness, you're looking at uh, conscientiousness, uh, uh, extroversion, uh, neuroticism. All of these uh, scores are easily obtained. Okay? Not only can you get those scores, but you can also get the level of confidence in those scores. Right? So it's typically a score from 0 to 1, you know, less than 0.5 is less likely, above 0.75 is very likely, and then you have a gray area between 0.5 and 0.75. The last uh, thing that I mentioned here, uh, by all, uh, you know, this is by no means uh, exhaustive. You know, I, I've just listed things that are commonly uh, used in text analytics. There could be other areas that I've omitted. Uh, modeling topics. So let's say you have Wikipedia and you want to make, make sense of this corpus, right? This corpus is huge, a variety of topics being discussed. Can I extract, you know, meaningful topics from this, right? And if I did extract those meaningful topics, uh, I might want to classify them, I may want to look at them. Uh, you know, how, uh, look at how ideas have evolved in Wikipedia over time. I may want to construct this uh, intellectual structure, right? The uh, evolution of knowledge within Wiki Wikipedia, and also group that together. So, top modeling topics is a very, very useful exercise. Okay. Okay. Uh, this picture uh, gives you uh, the sequence of activities that we do when we uh, employ text analytics, right? So we start at the far left end with uh, unstructured data, right? This is the raw data that's coming in, could be any form, this could be comments, you know, uh, complaints, anything. 
And uh, this data by itself, there's very little that you can do with it. Well, uh, let me take it back. Very little that you as an individual can do with it. Now, there are lots of tools out there, like IBM's Watson, for example, that actually takes the raw data. You don't have to filter it, you don't have to remove punctuation, you don't have to remove digits, you don't have to do anything. You give it to Watson and it, uh, it comes up with its analysis. Okay, so you just, it's raw. You don't really, as a developer, you don't have to do anything, right? Uh, now, if you were doing things yourself, let's say you were trying to build um, a matrix of documents and you want to do your own clustering or you want to look at document similarity or your topic modeling by yourself, you would then have to pre-process this data, right? Pre-processing is uh, simple, you know. Um, your programs cannot distinguish between uppercase and lowercase, so you need to convert it to a common case. You know, normally you convert lowercase or uppercase, right? You have to remove stop words, commonly occurring words like is and of and the which really come in the way of your analysis, your know, interpretation, right? So you want to filter those out. There may be other, uh, other stop words that are domain specific. You want to get rid of those as well, right? So we call these stop words, we build a thesaurus of stop words and get rid of all those words that are meaning, uh, you know, that don't add much meaning to our analysis. Uh, I will also remove uh, things like punctuation. And sometimes you have this, a, a variation of the same word, you know, achieve, achieving, achievement, right? Basically they're talking about achieve, right? So you may want to reduce it to the root word, you know, we call it the stemming, right? So you may reduce it to a root word, or you may do something called lemmatization, which is you can so reduce it to a root word that has a, uh, that, that exists in the dictionary, right? So you can, you can actually get rid of plurals and things like that. It's very, very useful for that. So once I've done my pre-processing, uh, it's then that I, I have data, uh, text that's a little more reliable, and I will then process this data, right? The common technique is to convert this to a matrix, right? So if I have a bunch of documents, uh, let's say we have 100 documents, and each of those documents has a bunch of words, right? So if I look at all the words across the corpus, there could be millions of those words, think of each of the words as a feature. They call it a feature, right? Or a term, right? So you have this, if you think, imagine a uh, matrix here, the documents are out here, right? These are your rows, and the columns would be the words, right? And then the intersection can be frequency, for example, how many times a particular word occurs in a particular document, right? In general, people don't find frequency very useful, right? Your frequency alone doesn't tell you a whole lot. They weight it, you know, they give a weighted score for the word. That's called term frequency, inverse document frequency, right? Because a word that occurs in every document is probably useless. A word that occurs frequently in very few documents is probably useful because it shows some thematic consistency within a set of documents, right? So the TF-IDF weighting scheme uh, takes this into account, right? It's basically looking at term frequencies and then multiplying that by log of the total number of documents in which the word occurs uh, by, uh, you know, the total number of documents by the total number of documents in which it occurs, right? And if it occurs in all, then this log, it becomes log one, zero, therefore you get a score of zero. Otherwise, you get a weighted score, right? And that is what is most frequently used if you look at books on information retrieval but from Stanford and other places. That's the TFIDF is the one that's very commonly used. Okay, people do use vectorizers and other things, and one can play around with those tools, uh, but that's those are the mechanics, right? And finally, uh, what? So what I've done is I took raw data, I pre-processed it, and I created a matrix. And this matrix now can be subjected to all kinds of uh, quantitative analysis, right? I can do multivariate statistics on that. I can do uh, principal competent analysis on to, to cluster these words. I can actually take these words and build a social network of the words, right? Which ones are central, which ones are peripheral, how are these words related to one another, and so on and so forth, right? It's very, very easy for me to do analysis once I reach the stage, right? Okay, so that's, that's the theory part of it. This is how we do things. Now let me demonstrate this with examples from my research or research that's ongoing. I'll start with one that's very academic in nature. So uh, the chair of my department, Dr. Whiteside, and uh, a statistician, Dr. Aiken, they came to me and said, look, uh, uh, we want to know if uh, statistic journals influence business journals. Right? That, that is a question. Uh, can, is there some way for us to show this? I said, yeah, we can, we can try you know, citation analysis. We can look at text analysis and so on. Right? Uh, so that's, that was the research question that I was trying to address. And we said, let's look at it or at snapshots in time. So we look at, looked at the year 2000, 2005, 2010, 2015, right? And so we identified a bunch of journals. So let me show you how, yeah. So this was the idea, you know, so uh, everybody agrees that statistics plays a key role in our research, especially in the social sciences. And um, 
they were interested in knowing if they could show that statistic journals actually do influence business journals, right? Um, particularly in this age of data analytics, where data analytics become more and more prominent, more useful, they wanted to see if there was a growing influence. You know, as you go from 2000 to 2015, do we see increasing influence of statistics journals, right? So the idea is very simple. You know, if there is a, if I were to cluster all these journals, business journals and statistic journals, and if there's a lot of influence, I should see statistic journals coming closer to the business journals, right? From a clustering perspective, that that's the idea. Specifically, how do the statistic journals relate to it in, in terms of lexical structure, right? So we started with there are two basic approaches to this problem. One is to use citations, which are easily available. I want I could take a bunch of journals and then look at their uh, uh, the, the flow of citations between them. How many times did journal A cite B? How many times did journal B cite A? Right? And by looking at the citation patterns, I can then uh, again do clustering or factor analysis and then come up with groups of uh, journals that belong together. But I can also look at the proximities of each of these groups. Right? Who's proximal to a particular group? Uh, so, uh, or you could use text analysis, right? So my interest is in text analysis, so I'm going to talk about the problems with bibliometric analysis. Although that served me very well, now it's time for me to move on to other areas. So I argue now that text analysis is probably a better way of looking at similarities, right? Uh, so uh, why, why am I using text analysis? Why am I arguing for text analysis? So among other things, citations disregard context. You, you, you don't know the context in which the citation appeared, right? You, you don't even, and we treat all citations alike. Every citation has uh, an equal score of one, right? You either cite it or you don't. Uh, but we know that some citations support your work. You, you, you cite an article to draw support, right? Or to, uh, to, to strengthen your argument. In certain cases, it's because you don't agree with somebody. You know, you say there's a flaw in this guy's methodology and that's why I'm citing it, right? Yet they're treated alike, right? We don't distinguish between one that you agree with and one that you don't. You, you disregard the context, completely disregard the context. Also in citation analysis, it's always been customary for us to look at the best authors or the best documents. We have disregarded the tail, right? There are lots of other documents, lots of other authors who contribute uh, to the body of knowledge, uh, yet we disregard them completely. We don't take them into account, right? We only look at those that are highly cited. That's because of computational limitations, right? We want to restrict it to 50 authors or 50 documents because it's more tractable. And, uh, and therefore, we, we do not you know, look at all the documents or all the uh, articles. So given these problems with citations, I said, why not look at text analysis, right? Because if I'm looking at text, I can look at all the documents. I don't have to say, I'm only going to look at the seminal articles or the seminal uh, authors here. I can look at every body of text that's been written and then try to figure out similarities. I can try to figure out what are the key topics being expressed, how are they related to one another, all those other details, right? So citation and text analysis together, I believe, offer you know more, far more insights than either one alone, right? So that's that's the idea. Uh, so we started with 36 journals, uh, 19, uh, 19 of those are business, 17 statistics. So if you find a journal missing from your discipline, uh, kindly uh, uh, ignore it. You know, uh, this, most of these were drawn from the Financial Times uh, list of journals, uh, but I know. Uh, MISQ, which is the premier journal in my area, is missing. You know, the first time around, uh, it's, it's uh, sacrilege, considering that I'm involved in the project, right? To leave that out. But anyway, uh, so we looked at the changing influence of statistic journals over time, and what we did to uh, make this happen was we downloaded abstracts from the Web of Science. Right? We have access to the Web of Science. You go on there, and for for each year, let's say the year 2000, we looked at each of these journals. We looked at each of those 36 uh, journals, and downloaded all the abstracts. Right? For each journal, so if you can, if you can picture this, I have one file, right, called uh, uh, SMJ, which is Strategic Management Journal, in which I have the the concatenated list of all the abstracts, right, and so for each journal, therefore, so I, I end up with 36 files, each of which contains text, which is nothing but the abstracts for the journal for that particular year, right. So once I have the body of text for each journal, uh, then it's a simple matter of going through my pipeline there, you know, for text analytics, pre-process that, look for similarities, and generate uh, insights, right? So, uh, these are the steps we did. Uh, abstracts, converted lowercase, we removed stop words, punctuation digits, then generated something known as a document term matrix, term here refers to words, right? It's also called a feature. And 
after I got that, it was very simple. You know, I can use the same the same text now to generate a word cloud. You know, if somebody wants to look at a good pictorial representation of words, which ones are prominent, which ones are not. So uh, that's what we did. We also did some clustering. You could use k-means, hierarchy. You know, once I have it in a matrix, uh, it's a similarity matrix. I can do anything with it, right? And finally, extracting topics using a technique called latent relevant allocation. Right? In the past, I've used other techniques, but uh, this seems to be the more popular one. Uh, that's what that's what we did. So here's an example of what we got. So uh, when I generated the my choice of background color is bad. You know, perhaps in the future I should change it, but. If you disregard that, you still see you know words that pop out at you in the year 2000, right? And then you can look at you know are there any significant changes, right? Uh, sadly, none. You know if you really look at this very closely, you know, prominence may change, but the words are still you're still looking at statistical terms. You're still looking at um, a consumer, market, uh, price, brand, you know things that are commonly been used you know uh, for for ages, right? Uh, since the inception of your marketing journals. So you don't really get, uh, in my view, in this particular uh, exercise, I didn't get any big insights, right? So we started looking at, uh, we took the same data, and we started, this is a multi-dimensional scaling map, right? It's an MDS, it's a two-dimensional map, and what we did was we took the, the matrix of similarity and then created the multi-dimensional scaling uh, map, which shows you proximities in two-dimensional space, right? So uh, all of my journals here have been abbreviated, so we don't recognize them. Um, uh, let me know if you're interested in any. Uh, any. Well, the story is very simple. Okay, all, across all four years, with minor shifts in individual journals, you will see that on the left, for example, you can see uh, ASQ by itself, but you can see SNJ, AMR, AMJ, so the management folk. Then you see MI, MIS and ISR, which stands to reason these are two premier journals in information systems. You can see POM, BS, and management science. They're all opera operations research, management science kind of articles. And uh, you see all the marketing journals, JCR, JMR, marketing science, and this. And uh, then you see that uh, you have all these uh, uh, accounting, economics, and finance journals. So you see econometrics playing a huge role in bridging the gap between the business journals and uh, the statistics journals. No big surprise here, right? So the pathway for the transfer of knowledge from statistics to business journals seems to be economics, finance, accounting, and then finally to you know marketing and to information systems, and, and that's a consistent story across time periods, right? It's very we're looking at a snapshot in time. Nevertheless, the the the, the, uh, the patterns are very very strong, right? What is missing from our analysis is computer science journals because we're looking at data science and machine learning and other things. <coughs> They're more prominent in the computer science literature, right? So if we had to extend the study, we would probably have to include those. And perhaps there's a new bridge now from, uh, from statistics to computer science to business. So if I'm an information system, I don't go to statistics journals. I don't understand the stuff. So I go to computer science, which has done a fairly good job of taking the statistical ideas, translating those to algorithms, which I can apply, right? So I'd rather go to a computer science machine learning uh, journal read that article, abstract out the concepts, and then use it my idea. So I would probably see a pathway. I might say all this is academic stuff, you know, how useful can this be for other types of things. My uh, answer to that would be, you know, think of similarity, sim similar types of data. I've used journals as the unit of analysis here, right? I could do this with authors, with inventors. If you look at patent databases, right? How different are patents from articles? Very similar, right? Uh, uh, you, you look at a patent, it's got references. Patents cite other uh, other patents. Patents have text, so I could take the same thing and then translate this into my innovation landscape. You know, how are companies innovating? How have they been doing to, uh, doing this for for years? Right? I can replicate this just using the patent data, right? And perhaps it will give me some good insights about why some some companies vanish from the landscape. You know, if I do this over time, longitudinally, I can see how they depart from a cluster where they were fairly secure, but slowly they started. They, it was left behind and it became isolated and they vanished from the landscape, right? We interested to know why Toshiba is where it is today, right? It's been sold. Uh, or why some why why Macy's is going out of business or whatever it is. I want to be able to study those things. So I can look at any form of text that might give me insights into it. You know, I can look at annual reports, I can look at uh, uh, you know 10K filings, anything that gives me a similarity of companies. I can replicate this, the, the same files, right? I can look at clusters, I can, I can take this. You know, once you do this, obviously you can do, um, okay, you can do a cluster analysis, right? So I can, this is probably a neater picture because 
clearly there are two, two clusters, two big clusters. And when I look at this, all of these are business journals, all of these are statistics and economics journals, right? And I think there was a time period when one economics uh, uh, journal jumped from statistics into, into the business side, right? So clearly, you can see this bridging activity that's going on, right? And this diagram is probably a little more compelling than, than just the MDS map that you saw earlier. Right. Uh, same thing for a different time period. Notice that this cluster seems to have gotten bigger, right? So there are more that are going and boring stuff from statistics, right? And, and but then we said, well, we have this, uh, th these 36 journals, and we have all the articles for the 36 journals. Can we figure out you know, what, key, what are the key topics, topic areas being discussed within these 25 journals, uh, th 36 journals, right? So that's called topic analysis. So what I did was I took this entire corpus and then used this uh, algorithm called LDA, right, which is called latent delete allocation. And I ran 10,000 10, iterations so that it would converge and give me more meaningful results. And I asked for 25 top topics, right? The choice of 25 was purely arbitrary, right? And will, will definitely not satisfy reviewer. They'll say, why 25? Why not 50? Why not uh, 20, right? Now, there are ways to circumvent the problem. You know, you can compute the log likelihood. You know, you can do 10 clusters, 15, 25, 30, draw, plot the log likelihood. And then when, it, when you see the elbow, that's the number of clusters. So I, I didn't do all this for this particular exercise. But this is just to demonstrate that you can extract topics, right? And when you get the topics, a little bit of uh, interpretation, you know, uh, subject to wisdom involved here. Uh, you can see that some of these things, I, I, I've just highlighted a few topics and I have to come up with these names. One may not agree with these names entirely. Now, if I want to really know what, to, what label to give these topics, I could go one step further. Not only can I get this, so this is a topic which is just a bunch of words. So actually what it's doing is it's looking at the distribution of topics across all the documents and it's looking at the distribution of words across each of these topics, right? So based on those, so it's, it's, uh, it's Bayesian probabilities it's actually working out and then giving me what's the likelihood that it'll actually give me probability scores for each word, right? And the most probable words, I asked for the top 20 words for each topic and those are the words that you see out there, right? I, not only can I do this, my algorithm also tells me the top five articles associated with each topic, right? So then I can go to each of those articles and see what they're talking about and come up with a more meaningful data, right? So it's fairly neat in terms of how I can extract information, right? What I have here is a heat map, right? And what this heat map does is uh, it's showing me all the, uh, all the journals. You can see all the 36 journals out here. And out here, I'm not given meaningful names. I just call them topic one through 11 or 12 or whatever. You know, you can see all the topics. But the heat map tells me how each of these journals contributes to a particular topic, right? So if I look at this topic 11, right, actually, uh, my scoring starts from zero, so it's topic 12. Actually, yeah. Could you maybe give us uh, an idea of maybe what the topic 11 might have been? Uh, I have no idea. That's, that's okay. So, but I, I probably have another example that's um, that's more meaningful than this. Okay, I have another diagram. I knew that would cause problems. So I have another diagram. It's the same thing, but a different domain, right? But I have the labels. So, if you can imagine what these are, some some topic area, right? And I want to know who, which journal, right? Let's say I have some interest in the topic area. I want to go read papers. Which topic, which journal should I go to? So I go back and look at my heat map, and I notice that it's pretty dark out here and uh, then go look at all the journals. So, you know, it turns out that most of these are statistical stuff, right? It's probably some topic related to statistics, right? Um, I could look at the seat map then to identify, you know, this is pretty prominent here. This is the analysis of probability, and uh, it would be nice to see what that topic is, topic 12, right? Seems very prominent here, has not been discussed anywhere else, right? So you might begin to wonder about it. All I'm saying at this time is that this could be companies, Right? And this would be the strategies that they are trying to evolve. Right? And I want to see what the strategic focus is. Right? This would be a time period. In fact, let me show you. Uh, uh, okay. So I'm, I'm jumping to, I'm done with one, one research uh, topic. Uh, I'm doing a very similar thing with uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Jingwo Wong. He's working in the area of cybersecurity. Right? And so cybersecurity has been around for quite a while. But uh, we have no idea how this has evolved. You know, what are the key topics? And what are the relationships? So, so we did. We took all the words. Right? We did. We actually downloaded 17,000 abstracts. Right? We used some keyword searches. 17,000 abstracts across computer science journals. So this is based on keywords, just keywords. 
right? So we took the 70,000 uh, abstracts, extracted all the words, and then gave it to a tool to come up with this diagram. It's a heat map of the words and their relationships. It's based on co-occurrence of the words, right? If two words co-occur on the same line, very frequently, they tend to come together on this map, right? And this was neat because what it shows me is, if you look at this little island, that island divides social sciences, cybersecurity research from computer science uh, research. Everything on the left-hand side pretty much is of a technical nature. You see algorithms, crypto systems, secret keys, everything is very computer science-like, right? And everything on the, most of the things on the right-hand side have to do with policies, with organization, with HIPAA regulations, you know. You can see that one is focusing on the technical side and the other is focusing on more of the social dimensions, right? Uh, but uh, when you use this tool, uh, there's another way to show the same diagram. It actually gives you a color-coded scheme of all the words. And by looking at each color, each color is a cluster. You can go back and look at the cluster of words and try to figure out you know, what the thematic area is, right? So, uh, with, okay, so with the same, uh, so this is probably what you were getting at, right? So we, we took the same uh, idea for cybersecurity, and we were interested in, so we came up with a bunch of topics, right? So uh, we called this general because we couldn't figure out what the topic was, right? It, it, was, it was dealing with all kinds of things with the security, right? So we just said, you know, anybody who wishes to write about security will have these keywords, right? So it's a very general topic. But then we get very specific, this uh, specific uh, cybersecurity issues related to risk and risk analytics. There's stuff on authentication, which is very clear. Access control, you know, accessing computers as well as databases and so on. There's, uh, uh, in education, in, uh, there's forensics, right? Forensics is also very specific. There was mobile, right? Mobile cyber, cyber security. So many of these areas are very, uh, they are distinctive and uh, you know what the topic areas are, right? Now in this example, what we were interested in knowing was, we have time period, since we have these articles, right, from 1991 to 2015, when were these topics dominant, right? Which ones endure, which ones fade away, right? That, that is what we are trying to get at. And the heat map, unfortunately this heat map, uh, my choice of color is probably bad. It doesn't show you those shades of gray and you know the, 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 the changes as they occur. It seems to be pretty abrupt. It's almost zero or one kind of shift. But if you look at the numbers, you can actually see how they are transitioning from one time period to another. Uh, just simple example, if you look at health, health security, Right, just security on health, uh, you see the time period, 1994, 95, all the way up to 2000, seemed very prominent, right? And then you see it's a little bit prominent here, 2001, 2002, surprisingly not much on health security thereafter, right? It'll probably resurface, but you don't see too much of that happening. Uh, you can see other things. Uh, so the idea here, yeah, go ahead. Why are the years out of order? That's because they cluster. Uh, see, this, is, this diagram tells you a lot more than just the heat map, right? It's also clustering these to tell you which years were similar in terms of the topics they dealt with, right? So if I look at this, 2003 and 2004, very similar, not surprising, right? One year from uh, But you can see that some are out of order. You can see that two, uh, two, two, or you have 2001, 2003, 4, and then you see that everything up to two, uh, it's, in, a, in, a, in a way, it's, it's, uh, it's telling you what's happening in different time periods, right? You can see that these are all clusters. I can, I can see two distinct clusters here, right? Everything from 92, 97, and then everything out here, which tells me that something was happening within cybersecurity in the first time period, right? That they were dealing with certain topics, and then something happened in the second time period, right? Now I can replace years with journals, right? If I knew which journals they were from, I could replace these, right? So you see, um, all I have to do is to take the same idea to a company, to a patent, to anything, any other source, and I generate diagrams like these to figure out, I, I can get you know, information about evolution of ideas, which, uh, and actually I'm working on another one where we are building a predictive model to see why somebody would choose a particular topic to publish it, right? So we're trying to come up with a predictive model. And we also want to see if, pro uh, if topics, like uh, they have a life cycle, just like products, do topics have the same type of uh, life cycle model? Do they have an S-shaped code? Do they have this maturity model and fall off, right? And it's, it's strikingly similar to products, right? And some topics have a shorter cycle than others. And, and why is that the case? That, that would be the best, right? Okay, uh, so all of that was related research, but I think it showcases some of the techniques you can use, right? 
the clustering, the, the uh, multi-dimensional scaling maps that you can do, the topic modeling, all very commonly employed techniques. You know, that's what people do to, uh, to uh, assess, uh, uh, to, to draw insights. Now, this is a project that I got roped into fairly recently, right? It's, uh, it's one of those things where you get lucky, uh, somebody has a paper, uh, gets a, re a device and resub it, and the reviewers ask for specific things, and you're the only guy they think can do it, right? So you, you get invited to be on the paper because of these special skills. And so the reviewers specifically said, well, they, they were looking at Kaggle. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Kaggle. Kaggle is this online platform. It's a crowdsourcing platform where they crowdsource machine learning solution to problems that companies and researchers put out there, right? And uh, it's a very competent, it's, it's actually a cooperative uh, environment where people compete uh, uh, for, for cash prices or sometimes it's for recruitment. You know, companies actually put data sets out there for recruitment purposes as well. So you're competing with others. At the same time, they cooperate. How do they cooperate? They cooperate by exchange, you know, so I don't, I, I'm stuck with a particular technique, right? I, I get, I'm trying to do something in machine learning and I, I don't get what I expect, so I, I, I initiate a thread, right? And I post a message saying, I'm having problems with this confusion matrix here, you know, it's not giving me the, the accuracy that I'm looking for. Is there something that I'm doing wrong, right? And people respond to that. Now, why would they respond to it? Because they're helping out a competitor, right? So the question that my researchers were asking is, can, can we explain knowledge sharing behaviors, right, uh, in this setting? Uh, and they had done all the analysis, and but the reviewers still wanted to know what kind of knowledge was being shared, and uh, why we had not, why they had not used the text at all, right? And the first thing that occurred to me was, A, they could have created a social network, right? I have a network, I seek knowledge, and there are people who are responding to me, right? So there is a knowledge-seeking network that I can create. I go, it's like advice-seeking networks in organizations that have been studied extensively, right? But more importantly, I have all the text for each user. I know all the posts by a particular person, right? So I took all the text for each of these persons, right? And there are about 2,800 of them, uh, which is a fairly large corpus per person because some of them are very active in posting. And I took each of these and gave it to something known as a tone analyzer. Right? And what the tone analyzer does is it uh, senses different tones. It looks at social tones, which is basically the five-factor model of personality. It looks at emotional tones like anger, disgust, and uh, joy, sadness, those sorts of things. It also looks at things like the level of confidence in your writing, right? Uh, how confident are you? How tentative are you, right? Uh, uh, so all of these have implications for behaviors, right? And I also found a paper, so I find this, and I said, well, I have this, I, I know I can get numbers, but these numbers are meaningless if I don't find support in the literature for knowledge sharing behaviors, right? And sure enough, we found a conceptual piece that's, that talked about the five-factor model and its implication for knowledge sharing, right? And then I asked one of the co-authors to take the data, I sent the files across with the five personality uh, traits, uh, num scores for those, I sent it across, 2,800 of those, and uh, she ran the analysis and found every one of these to actually support knowledge sharing behaviors, right? Um, so, um, what, what we are trying to say here is that this project was approached as a regular traditional research project where they simply looked at all the data. The text was completely ignored. The social network was completely ignored, right? And uh, they had good findings, but reviewers said, you know, maybe there are some insights about because this whole project is about knowledge sharing, but you're not showing me what the knowledge is, right? Where is the, it's all embedded in the text? And I think that's that's the insight that one can draw from this, right? Uh, actually, I have a quick demo. Did they share the credit for that article? <laughs> a big part? Oh, I, I become a co-author. Okay, right? all right. Yeah, so this is one of those that's easy ones sharing. where I just run an analysis and become a co-author <laughs> because I have to write up that part, right? Okay. Which should be fairly easy, but it's still not starting a project afresh and then you know going through the review process, right? So I have a quick, if you indulge me for just a moment, I can show you this. I don't know if we can get to it. Uh, do we have access to the internet here? Oops.
Okay, so let's go on. Oh, we do that. When, when I teach, uh, so I'm teaching two classes related to all that I'm talking about. One is the data science class in Python. So they, they're pretty much asked to do these things. They, every student coming out of the class should know how to do most of these analyses. I hold back certain things, but you know, that, that, those are the APIs, you know, which they can figure out. Things that you can go and pick up on your own. But uh, the basic idea of how to do it, they should know. Every one of them should know it. Have you attempted or have anyone attempted to do sort of a three-dimensional matrix where you have the journals, the topics, and the years? No, no. I, I'm not a visual guy. You know, I, I can't see anything beyond 2D. Uh, so, and I'm sure, you know, the problem is also presently in the journal, right? So, uh, it's not, it's online, perhaps you can show a 2D, but I can see, you know, for those who can look and imagine what, what the 3D would look like. Uh, I, there, there's there are definitely insights to be gained, but I can't. I'm, you know, even 1D is a problem for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, okay, I, I'm going to have one. Well, can, can you just go back to the next one? Um, oh, it wasn't coming up at all. Challenge out here, so um, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting to the end of my presentation, so I can very quickly wrap it up, tell you what I had, you know, what I had on the remaining slides, if I can remember. I put them all together this morning at 1:30, so <laughs> so it's top of the mind recall. Uh, so the demo, uh, I can send you guys the link, and you can try it out, if, or if you just Google Tone Analyzer from IBM Watson, right? If you go to that website, they have a small demo. And they actually have a conversation between an agent and a customer, right? You have the body of text and you can analyze that. Now, if you don't want to analyze that, you have your own text, you can just drag and drop it into that. It'll give you a good analysis. It'll give you the, the model of personality. It'll give you all kinds of things, right? Uh, you don't always get things in a graphical fashion, right? You have to imagine if you have uh, a thousand documents and you wanted to get analysis, you wanted to analyze every one of those, you can't drag and drop a thousand. Maybe you could, maybe you could get your PhD student to do that, but it's, it's, it's a bit of a pain, right? So what we do instead is we just write programs, right? So I have an API, I write a program, but then I don't get all the graphics, I have to do it myself, right? Which is not a big deal, but I, I grab the data, it comes in JSON format, I, I parse it, and convert it to a spreadsheet, and then I'm ready to do my analysis, right? Okay, so I just uh, want, the remaining slides, I, I, I think I just kind of mentioned the other to other projects that I'm uh, uh, working on related to text. Now, there are two uh, I'm, that I'm doing with uh, uh, linguistics, right? Uh, the, both of these are part of uh, an internal grant that we got from the Digital Arts and Humanities Institute, uh, $10,000 grants each, and we are now trying to write it up, and uh, uh, we are trying, trying to send a proposal to NIH and to uh, some other place. I forget the name of the institution. But uh, the first of these projects uh, deals with um, uh, the, uh, the, the language employed by pre-diabetics. We are looking at the student population, we are looking at focus groups, and they have been uh, conducting semi-structured interviews with these students, uh, focus group. Uh, all the, uh, uh, the, the conversations are now being transcribed, uh, and so I get the text. 
I'm going to analyze, you know, how uh, uh, words related to pre-diabetes and uh, type 2 diabetes, anything related to cardiovascular risk and other things, you know, what's the conversation around these words, right? What I also plan to do is to extract, uh, you know, all these other characteristics about each of the students and then try to correlate that with the actual performance in class and other behaviors, right? The whole idea is to understand our students, understand who is predisposed, right? Who's like, who complies with stuff, who does it, and then to bring in interventions, right? So that's, that's the, the entire purpose of this. And so there's a lady from kinesiology, uh, Rebecca Garner, uh, Stevon uh, Laurel from uh, linguistics, and I, the, we are the three on that project. The second project that I'm working with, also from Link, uh, so Stevan again is uh, the principal investigator. Uh, we have uh, Jacqueline Fay from the English department, and in that we're looking at the medical vernacular and how it has changed from the, from or from ancient times to the present time. Right. So we're looking at old English text all the way to contemporary text, and so we're looking at medical remedies, uh, the context in which they were employed. You know. So I'm currently grappling with uh, old English which is a pain because Old English <laughs> has no English. It has a lot of Latin, right? And, uh, and then so figuring out what the medical terms are. Because every time I run my topic modeling with English, you know, I can say these are meaningless words. Now I have to run to Jacqueline, uh, Jacqueline Fay and say, you know, what does this mean, right? Uh -huh. She said, no, this is useless. You need to throw it out. So we are going through several iterations trying to figure out what's, what's going on. But at the end of the exercise, uh, so the, we are actually sending this off to a paper in, uh, Dublin, where they're talking about the difficulties of dealing, you know, with such uh, such languages, anything other than English. And I think there's a lot of stuff of methodologically, there are lots of contributions to be made in terms of how do you identify stop words, right? So even text, right? So I'm dealing with text, uh, depending on the tool you use, if it is in, I, these are all HTML files, I convert that to text. When I convert to text, I lose some, if you've seen old English, they have all those funny characters, right? So you lose some of those. Uh, and sometimes it's an ASCII format, sometimes it's an Unicode, right? You want a consistent format so that you don't lose words. When you do try to do matching, they should actually be the same. Sometimes they look alike, but they, it says no, it's a false, you know. So, so those are the things we're grappling with. Uh, I'm working with Suan here and uh, Dr. Keiyu Chen from my department. And uh, we have an interesting problem here. So the idea is, you know, does, does language influence the way you understand things, and how does it impact uh, problem understanding and uh, eventually problem solution, right? Because uh, based on problem understanding, you have a conceptual model, you evolve a solution space, and then you solve the problem, right? Now, if we worded the same thing, you know, semantically similar problem statements that are uh, structurally different, right? Syntactically different, um, would, would it make a difference in terms of problem solving, right? How would it impact that? So we are running some experiments. Uh, we, have, we don't have a big enough sample size. Uh, so as we speak, uh, she's the expert on predicate logic and uh, uh, the structure of languages. And I'm the, the so-called tools expert here. Uh, and you know, so we're trying to see if we can make any sense of that. Um, I think uh, there are others. Uh, I, I know I, uh, we are looking at uh, narcissistic behavior of CEOs, right? So we're looking at uh, letters of CEOs to their, uh, to their uh, stakeholders. Uh, so what can we gather from this? You know, studies have been done in the past, but they look at you know, commonly employed words, uh, the number of times they use the word I or we. Now we can, with, with all these tools, we can look far beyond that. And with the personality insights, uh, the social tones that they use, uh, you can get really deep insights into what they're saying. Okay? Uh, so I'm combining that with images, right? So, um, so when they write the letters, they also embed the images, right? So the size of the image tells you something about their narcissistic uh, uh, predisposition, right? But more than uh, that, I can take the image and actually analyze it just the way I would analyze text. So if you go to Google's uh, cloud platform, they have a lot of APIs for analyzing uh, face, right? So you can, or images. <laughs> so I can get captions from images, I can get, uh, details of an image, you know, how much, uh, how many objects are embedded in the image, uh, how much uh, sexual content is in the image, right, whether there's nudity or no nudity. You get a lot of information from images, so if I can take those, uh, combine it with the text, and come up with a profile of a CEO and say, this is Ellison from Oracle, he's a narcissist, you know. So, so, <laughs> so, uh, those, uh, those are some of the other projects.
bunch of other things, but uh, with all this, I think it's not text alone. Uh, it's combining, we have the ability to combine text with uh, images, and then if you have uh, geographical information systems, you know, you have latitudes, longitudes, uh, you have really a uh, nice way of uh, interpreting things. You, know, you can look at consumer behaviors, performances, preferences, and uh, pretty get pretty close to offering personalized services. And most of this is self-taught? This is completely self-taught. Uh, right. It's all completely self-taught. So I'm a dangerous data scientist. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, oh, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. <laughs> so one of the um, things that I'm always curious about is um, have we sort of, we know certain claimed authorships mm -hmm. across, uh, for instance, audit reports or uh, CEO's letters or president's letters and so forth. Um, can we then look at similarities across documents and identify if it was written by them or their speechwriters and plan and sure, so different things like that? We should be able to. So the reason I, I was asking this question is one could then conceivably look at financial statements or prospectuses and see are they similar by investment banker, auditor, right. CEO, you know, things like that? We, we should be able to do that. Okay. We should be able to do that. In fact, now that you mention it, interestingly, some guy went and studied uh, tweets from Trump. And, uh, you know, it makes it, uh, for an interesting discussion otherwise, but he's a data scientist. And he found that some of his tweets, so what he did was he not only looked at the tweets, but he also looked at the device from which the tweets were being sent. Apparently, he was using two devices. So the, most of his tweets come from two devices. One is uh, an Android, and the other is an iPhone, right? And most of the negative comments come from the Android, right? <laughs> uh, and the other ones tend to be a little positive, right? Which led him to surmise that the iPhone tweets are actually being written by somebody else. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, there are... You know, very similar things. You can, you can. I, th I think there are very. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm bereft of ideas. You know, that's where. I, that's why I seek out my more knowledgeable colleagues. And uh, I, I think there's a lot that can be done. Because there was a period of time when the auditors were not identified by name, or we didn't know. Right. Um, in certain countries, they've always been known. So yeah. then we could type these using the no known person, then go backwards and see which are most likely them. Right, right. And, and so they've used extend, it on, expand our uh, data set. You remember uh, J.K. Rowling, she wrote a mm -hmm. book where she, she yeah. you know, she it was uh, nom de plume. She didn't use her real name. Mm -hmm. and they did identify, you know, they used a bunch of text and they were able to identify that it was her. She her was the the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure, I think uh, there are interesting prospects. What are the best disciplines? This seems so multidisciplinary. What are the best disciplines to take advantage of these kind of tools? Well, see, there is the computational side, which is where I come from, which is basically the language. Uh, I, I don't, I don't understand the, uh, uh, I don't understand morphology and you know the the, the natural language processing aspects. Uh, I take courses, but uh, it's beyond my ken. Uh, but I do, I can do, I can take a tool, and I know what the tool gives me. I try to interpret it, you know, based on. Uh, either my uh, expertise or I involve others who understand this. Uh, but I really think a solid background in computational linguistics, right? Um, I keep talking to Stevan and you know, we don't have, really have a good course in computational linguistics, I think, right? Um, language translation, right? Language translation is still a problem, right? Translating from one language to another. Um, I think that background is really needed uh, if you want to dig deeper. Um, so it's computation, it's that, and then finding a problem to solve, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's multidisciplinary, uh, for sure, right? As indeed are most of these things in machine learning. Right? Uh, the insights you get from uh, bioinformatics or from genomic uh, processing can be used maybe in text processing somewhere, right? So um, all these competitions are very nice because sometimes you have people from a completely different area. There's a professor of English who won a data science competition because he applied certain techniques that he was familiar with from his domain, right, which is novel in this setting. Um, so when you put all these people together from diverse disciplines and give them problems to work on, you get insight that would otherwise not be available. Do you have a file that is where idiomatic things go that you simply can't work with? 
um, phrases, words. Well, yeah, what, what we do, and it's uh, project to project, right? So project to project, I compile a list of stop words, right, that will not work in this domain. Yeah, yeah. the answer to that is yes. And sometimes um, you compile it, uh, if I'm looking at journal articles, uh, it's a pain because they use words like conclusion, in conclusion, finally, you know, all of those are useless words, right? They, they don't qualify as stop words in, when you look at stop words, uh, yet they are, they detract from um, the, uh, the actual meaning. So I have over time built uh, my own uh, list of words, you know, that I routinely filter out when I, when anything to do with academic. Now if I move to the corporate world, I may have to come up with my, with a, an entirely different list of words that I would like to filter out. But, you have to systematically build that library, yeah. Yeah. right? And some tools do that automatically, and that's what they're doing. And all of these tools that I'm talking about, IBM Watson, uh, there's another tool called LIWC, you know, Penny Breaker from UT Austin, has developed this. They now have an API, actually. They've spun off a company called Receptivity, which has an API. They charge $50 per month for academics, right? You can, you're allowed up to 100,000 documents that you can send to them for analysis. Uh, what they do is, uh, the text that you send for analysis, uh, doesn't belong to you. They take it. They keep it. They'll tell you that. They'll tell you when you sign up, one of the terms and conditions is that they have rights to the text that you analyze. Right? And what they are doing is they are using that to refine their own algorithms. So. Yeah. Uh, what kind of tool you mentioned, whether it's Right. They might be using some base referencing language for the process. Right. But the base language the way it is used might differ from geography to geography, maybe country to country. So how does it take into consideration those aspects? How does it control those aspects? So, um, Can you repeat his question? Yeah, so uh, yeah. what he's saying is that when I send something out to IBM Watson, right? Uh, Watson is doing all the processing. His point is there is uh, probably a language that they use. Correct me if I'm right. Yeah, so for example, the way Americans speak or the way the Britishers speak. They might be using some different colloquialisms, they might be using certain different right. phrases, they might be using certain different uh, linguistic structures. So how does the system take into consideration? System does not. System learns as it goes along, right? So system, I use the system, I'm an Indian guy with uh, things Indian will slip in from time to time and that's <laughs> part of the learning process. As far as Watson's concerned, you couldn't tell an Indian from some, anybody else as far as the language is concerned, right? Uh, but I think over time, as it learns, it's, it's a learning app. See, there's a lot of AI and cognitive stuff going on, right? And that is learning. As, as you send stuff in, that's, this is basically what's happening with chatbots. You go to certain sites, you chat, right? You're not chatting with a human being, you're chatting with a robot, right? And the robot actually senses how you think and feel, right? So when you say, I'm really annoyed with your service, it says, uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry to hear that, you know, what can I do? You know, uh, I, can, I can give you, a, take $10 off your next bill. So it's a robot that's doing all this. So there is so much artificial intelligence going on behind the scenes, um, it's learning constantly. So, so I don't think they are training it for, it's impossible with different dialects and different languages and different a accents and uh, different ways of expressing things. Even within India, you see the amount of variation, right? Uh, it's a la language is largely uh, a function of your your upbringing, your experiences, what you've read. You know, uh, so when I try to write, it, it's uh, Dickensian. You know, I can't say simple stuff, right? I can't write a simple sentence. I have to say you know, to say something like uh, uh, this person is dying, right? I mean, if you've read Oliver Twist, he says there's considerable difficulty in uh, you know. Uh, Oliver had considerable difficulty in taking upon himself the office of respiration. Right? <laughs> we, we, we have been exposed to that kind of read. You end up writing that way too, right? So uh, it's uh, the more it learns, you know. I, I think these things are still experimental. In fact, they call it the beta, beta, beta API. It's not still not a fully functional API. Right? So my point was that there might be differences in the interpretations that the system gives out right. based on those linguistic differences. So uh, that's it. maybe the conclusion might be different from what we were looking so for. So you have a doctoral dissertation or at least a paper there. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. take this, you can vary your uh, subjects, right? You can have a control group and you can run an experiment.
see what kind of inputs and then see what kind of interpretation. In fact, uh, we, what Suman and uh, we are doing is we, we not only give a problem statement to the student, but we have the student uh, recall the problem statement from memory. You know, tell us what problem you're solving. And then we are trying to see if that description fits the description of the, the original description. You know, what's the departure, right? If it departs greatly, then we know that this person hasn't understood it. Just dive straight into the problem, right? So you could, I, I think you can devise experiments uh, around this. So let's all uh, thank Dr. Noor for coming here today. And we're going to have... Thanks.